Hello and welcome to First Generation American Project, Drinks and Dialogue. My name is Anya Jablonowski. I'm the founder of First Generation American Project. First Generation American Project was launched to connect with first generation Americans and collect the stories of what it's like growing up with hybrid cultures in the U.S. So a lot of times we have first generation Americans who just naturally know that they're FGA, they were born here, their parents are from somewhere else. Uh, we also have first generation Americans who are born overseas and come here at the age of 10 and under. That also counts as first generation American. What I'm also interested in is learning about the experiences of those who are half first generation American, meaning one of their parents was born overseas or across the border and the other parent is first, second, third, any generation American. So I'm excited today to have in studio one of my good friends, Jay Pinedo, who is the co-founder and instructor at Iron Rooks Chess Collective. Jay, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Anya. Now, you were a bit uh, surprised that I asked you to join First Generation American Drinks and Dialogue because you really hadn't thought about being first generation American. That's right. And so we originally met up, you know, just as friends, talking about your website, and I wanted to know where this chess love came from. Well, it came from my father, who is uh, from Mexico. And as soon as I heard that, I was like, oh, <laughs> light bulb, let's <laughs> talk about that. So I want to know a bit about what your uh, father's experience was like, how old was he when he came here, why did he come here, um, walk us through your dad's experience a bit. Um, well, my father was born in Mexico City, Mexico, and uh, he went back and forth between Mexico City and Mexicali, which is a border town, and he didn't start coming over to America until, I think he's 1972, mm -hmm. and uh, did back and forth around there and eventually ended up uh, marrying my mother and moving to America in 1982. So why did he decide to come to the U.S.? Was there, uh, so from like the, you know, authentic first generation experience, from all these interviews that I've had, a really common theme is that, you know, there's just, um, it, it's like this pull of the American dream, but it's not just this like glamorized, American dream where people are trying to seek out, you know, capitalism and commerce and everything. It's more about like basic civil rights. It's about like leaving a place of oppression and, you know, coming to a place where you can actually function as a human being and have a life that actually has freedom. So um, what was your dad's experience like? Well, that's definitely a big part of it. Um, he had a lot of the oppression that you might read about, but you don't see it if you're here in America the whole time and grown up here, but it's it's a real thing. And just over the border in Mexico, there's a lack of civil rights. Um, it's just even basic rights as if uh, the police stop you and they want to rough you up or take your things, they can't and you can't complain about it or do anything. Mm -hmm. So and this is something that he experienced in the seventies himself. Yes. Said. Yeah. So it's. It's really fascinating to think about, you know, just that sheer difference that, you know, some some of us as Americans don't really see or think about, um, and Absolutely. then we hear about our parents' stories. So before I invited you for Drinks and Dialogue here in the studio, did you ever really have these conversations with your parents, or did you just kind of, you know, grow up and have a normal childhood, but never really have these like cultural and background discussions with your family? Well, I grew up mostly just as an American in America, and I knew my father was from Mexico, and once in a while a story would come out about something that happened over there, but mm -hmm. not so much in detail. And I guess um, if you don't ask him, he really doesn't tell you sure. since it's in the past. So. Sure. And he's just kind of accustomed to just going on with his life, and yes. you know, he's in the moment. Um, so when did you ask him? I think it was a couple weeks ago that we started talking about potentially doing this interview. Did you start like digging for some information and? Absolutely. As soon as I started, <laughs> what was his reaction? Well, I was asking him questions, and he he wondered what's what's this for? Why are you so curious? <laughs> He's now? on to you. Like okay, <laughs> of course he this, has a son. This is going somewhere. So 
once I started asking questions, he had no problem telling me about the stories, but mm -hmm. he was wondering why, why all of a sudden interest. Sure. And I'd say the, the info I had of his life over there in Mexico is tenfold just by, you know, having a long conversation about That's great. what was it like growing up? What did you do? Sure. You know, even in, in detailed stories about getting in the car with friends, you know, four friends. We do that all the time here. We take a trip somewhere. Well, the cops stopped them, and he played the guitar. He, I remember he had an acoustic guitar well. Mm -hmm. We were growing up, but so he had his guitar. So were they, like, going, driving for a gig? Yes. Okay. And uh, that was the thing to do. So they got him out of the car, and luckily he was holding his, uh, his guitar at the time. Mm -hmm. So they, they roughed him up, and they hit him a few times, and he took some hits, but more so the guitar took some hits. Was they, there a reason why they stopped him? Well, they thought that they were someone else, or so they said. Just a classic mix-up. And mix afterward, they said, oh, we, we thought you were somebody else. Carry on. And, that and then it. what happens? And they get, you just they get, back, get in back in the car, and, and they, they're lucky they didn't get something else pinned on them. Right, right. Yeah, that's it. You know, and we, we do hear about stories similar to that over here, but then immediately people would go to their lawyer or, you know, file a complaint Absolutely. or something. Like, that, that kind of stuff difference. just doesn't go under the radar. Yes. Yeah. Well, so your father is from Mexico, and then your mother is actually Polish and German, you said, right? Yes. So tell us a bit about your mom's side of the family. Well, mom and mom's side of the family, they've been in Pittsburgh for many generations. Um, they're, my mother's great-grandparents, so my great-great-grandparents were on the, my grandfather's side from Germany mm -hmm. and on my grandmother's side from Poland. Mm -hmm. So strictly uh, half and half. So do you eat cabbage tacos? <laughs> no, but I have had my share of sauerkraut okay. and, and tacos, but never together. Okay, <laughs> just keep those two plates separate. Yeah. Good call. So, um, did you grow up with any kind of like Polish or German cultural influence other than that, or was it like pretty Americanized from your mom's side? You know, it was it was very Americanized, and my mother they they actually ended up moving around a lot. Well, our family did. Mm -hmm. um, for my mother's work, so mom had a good job, and for my father it was hard to find a job because he had a master's in Mexico, but mm -hmm. when it transferred over here, there were some the issues. Yeah, and yeah. it took a while to even get recognized. And I think it, it was recognized as a bachelor's in time. So, mm -hmm. you know, it took six years there. It's four years worth the uh, American in transfer, I guess, right. with the way the credits worked. So he was home a lot, and he would end up taking care of me and my sister and do the cooking and them. So what would your dad cook for you when mom was at work, like before you guys went to school? Well, my favorite was quesadillas. Nice. <laughs> so I wasn't much of a meat eater as a child, so sometimes tacos, um, mole, guacamole. Mm -hmm. so is mole the short it's the, uh, word for well, the guacamole, mole is, or is it the, different? It's kind of a chocolate-based sauce. Oh. Um, yeah, there's like 20 components that go into that. I'm going to have to get a recipe from your dad after this. That's going to have to be just a, a whole other thing you do on mole. Okay, let's, <laughs> I'm down for that <laughs> any time. Anything chocolate, that's fine. Uh, so then your mom would be at work, your dad would take care of you guys, and he's making all these traditional Spanish cuisines. Um, was there any Spanish spoken at home with your dad, or did you have any um, bicultural lingual experiences? He did uh, attempt to teach us a little bit. I guess it wasn't a, a main focus, so it didn't stick too much. But I remember some key words to say, oh, that's rojo, red. Mm -hmm. And uh, counting, of course, that's a basic way to start. And um, it happens it teaches our prayers in Spanish. So See, and that's interesting, too, because my, my first language is Polish. You know, I was born here, you know, mm -hmm. raised with all Polish people in my family. And my grandma taught me how to pray in Polish. And so when I, if I ever recite any prayers internally, it's always like major reactions to pray in Polish. And then, you know, of course they go to like an American church, but nonetheless, like we still have the Polish mass. And it's, it's interesting to have that like foundation of your spirituality in a different language. Yes. Do you find yourself reciting it in your head in Polish as you're hearing it? 
I always recite it. So it's like if I'm walking down a dark alley or something, and you know, it's <laughs> Chicago, like you take shortcuts. Yes. And I get scared naturally, so I'll be there and I'll be like, I need a little help. And I'll, I'll just like say a little Polish. I still, I still remember some. And, uh, and I think they're extra special because my grandma taught me. Well, Babcha, Babcha taught me. So, you know, it's like it's got an extra like shortcut to God. Yes. <laughs> he loves her. Okay, so. Um, you spent a lot of time with your dad, of course, and you mentioned that your father had a master's in Mexico, and when we had our pre-interview, you mentioned that he was uh, involved with math and science, and he had a huge passion for chess, yes. and this was his profession as well. That's right. So that's why we have the chess board here. So you are the co-founder and instructor of Iron Earth's Chess Collective, so tell me a bit about how you got into chess, how old were you, and you know what your dad's involvement was with that, and then also what is Iron Rook's Chess Collective? Well, my my earliest memory is actually chess. Mm -hmm. He started teaching us the three, myself and my sister, I think, well, she was four, older sister. Mm -hmm. And I think that the theory that this is my earliest memory is because chess gets your brain to interact and deeper thought than mm -hmm. if I were just playing with um, action figures, per se, or sure. the hammer block toy. The hammer block toy. <laughs> so I remember I was doing tournaments as early as three, too. Wow. I wasn't any good, but... I, I guarantee <laughs> you that you, as a three-year-old playing chess, would knock me out as an adult right now playing chess. I don't know about that, but I had a good teacher, so... Right. And... Um, that being part of my, my childhood, that gave me a love for things that make you think early on. Now, also, I, I need to interject with this thought, too. Yes. So, uh, thinking about as a child and your childhood experiences, uh, you did mention in our pre-interview that you had actually gone back to Mexico with your dad for vacation before. So, was there any kind of, like, culture shock in that sense, or did it look and feel different? Um, we did. We did visit Mexico. We moved around a little bit. We ended up in El Centro, California at some point, and that's very close to the border. And we ended up taking family trips down there to see that side of the family. Mm -hmm. And I, I know as soon as you cross the border, it's a whole other atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And there's, it's, it has a, a reminiscent feel of a market in India. If you ever see that in, mm -hmm. uh, on TV or a documentary, um, there's there's a lot of street vendors there, mm -hmm. and I remember it being very dusty. It was hot and dusty. Hot and dusty. And um, everything seemed a little more sepia. Right, right. Just kind of like the, um, I think of like old westerns or something like exactly. that. Exactly. very sandy clay everywhere, like yeah. clay bowls. The buildings actually looked like some of them were formed of clay. Wow. <laughs> so, okay. And, and I just, I remember us discussing that as so I had to go back to that thought. But, so now you're a child, you're in these tournaments, you're learning chess, you've got a great teacher. Mm -hmm. um, and then I assume you just carry this on throughout your entire adolescence, right? You've never stopped playing chess. Well, we played in tournaments up until like about 12. Mm -hmm. And then I, for school or moving or whatever reasons, I didn't play for a while. Okay. And then around 16, probably, I started, you know, a friend said, oh, you know how to play chess? Let's play chess. I'll crush you. That's always the thing, when people know how to play chess. And then you just got this secret Okay, I'll weapon. play. <laughs> it was like, oh, I'm actually pretty good at this, and I forgot all about it for a couple mm -hmm. of years. And when, you, when you're a little older, of course, you have more appreciation for things. So mm -hmm. versus between 16 and 12, four years later, I'm, I'm seeing a little bit deeper into the mechanics of the game mm -hmm. and how much uh, replay value there is in it because very infrequently you'll play the same chess game twice mm -hmm. unless it ends in checkmate and two or four moves it's probably and not going to be the same one game signature move that you do. Well, there's, there's but some... everyone thinks differently so everyone's going to react to different moves yes okay now i have played chess very few times in my life uh, my brother was actually pretty decent. I don't know if he was as pro as you, but you know, my brother's two years older than me, and I was always kind of like a tomboy, and he was my hero. So anything he did, I wanted to do. So, so, so when he first started <laughs> doing chess, 
And then I decided maybe I should stick to checkers. That might be easier for me. But um, it's been at least a decade and a half since I've played chess. Wow. So let's pretend that I'm a student at Iron Rooks Collective. So first, tell me what Iron Rooks Collective, Chess Collective is. And then pretend I'm one of your like four-year-old students. All right. Well, what Iron Rooks Chess Collective is, is an enrichment program that teaches chess. Um, of course, you know, well, if you don't know, there are many articles and research studies done talking about how chess can improve many different fields. I won't even get into that. You can look up all sorts of information, but mainly critical thinking, cognitive development, and mm -hmm. it just gets the, the gears working on why am I doing something, consequences and actions, that sort of thing a lot earlier. So if you were one of my students that uh, has never played before, well first I'd, I'd figure out where your game was at, because you said you did play it before, so that's an idea. Do you remember any of the chess pieces? Do you know how they move? Let's pretend I've never played chess All right. before. <laughs> so, new student, okay. You've never played chess before. Well, there's six different pieces in chess. Okay. But the best way to start here. is with just one of them. And we okay. introduce this little guy. His name is Pawn. Now, the Pawn is kind of a weird piece because it's the only piece in chess that moves one way but captures a different way. So I'm going to show you how the pawn moves. The pawn moves one space forward. And then you would try. And I say the pawn moves one space forward again. And then he moves one space forward. And then eventually I'd show you, oh, this pawn's stuck now. He actually can't move forward because pawns capture a different way than they move. So we're going to expedite the game just a little bit and move some pieces and then say, oh, wait. I made a mistake. This pawn can actually move now because he can't move forward, but he can capture by going one space diagonally where these two squares connect by their corners. So mm -hmm. if you could use your piece and bump my piece out of the square, leave your piece there and take mine off the board. Ah, that's capturing. All right, I lost the pawn. Okay, I'm going to make another move. Now, you missed this. This was the same thing. You could have captured me there. But what about the guy in the... Oh, okay. But See, I can capture And I'm thinking of checkers where you could jump over. Ah, uh, yes. If there was an empty space and it was sure, checkers, sure. maybe. But no, in chess you always land on the piece to capture it. Okay. So, well, you didn't take me, but it's my so turn now, so I can take you. Got it. Oh, we're still playing. Okay. Yeah, just a little bit more. <laughs> well, I, okay. I just set myself up for success oh. there. If you put a piece in danger, that's right. I can capture it. Uh-huh. And the game goes on, you have to play to, to learn and have it really stick. <laughs> if you're not experiencing, you're going to miss it. And then maybe it's good to, you know, while learning, make it really obvious. Mm -hmm. I want like, you to see that, nudge, oh, it's in nudge, danger. Nudge. Oh, no, maybe what did I do? Maybe if you're going to move the other piece, I will. <laughs> and, of course, would have the, the students, if there's an odd number I might play, but if it's an even number, they'd be playing this, and I'd be giving them pointers. Mm -hmm. as we go on. So the idea in this game, Pontastic, is to be the, the first person So this to get game is called Pontastic. Pontastic, that's right. Awesome. And it's, the idea is to get your pawn across the board first. So I'm going to make a move. And uh, go ahead and make any, any other move. Okay, I'm going to make a move where I'm putting a pawn in danger, but I don't want you to take, oh wait, you could take me, but you can actually run by me, and then none of my other pawns can stop you. Oh, okay. So go ahead and run so that pawn past me. Instead of being greedy for pieces, That's I can right. just move ahead and then... I can't stop you. One, two, three. It doesn't matter what I do. Your next three moves are set. Got it. Oh, I can't stop you. What if I put a piece in danger here? Take that pawn. Take the pawn. Oh, why are you taking the pawn? You had two squares to win. All right, it slows you down one turn, but it doesn't oh, matter. You're going yeah, to you win. You tricked me there. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you did there. Okay, well, this is great. All right, so let's say I just uh, kick butt and pawn cast. So after that, we'd, uh, okay, you want a pawn test because when a pawn gets across the board, it turns into a queen. And we oh. learn that's a special rule for the pawn. Now, in this game, you win by that. In chess, it just means you have an extra queen. So then with beginners, you essentially start with the game of Pontastic. Yes. Okay. And then from there, we would introduce more things. 
over time. Um, of course, there's one more move with the pawn, but it might be a little much at first, so we add it on a second game. Now a pawn has a special move on its very first turn, it can actually go two spaces forward. It's like the starting line of a race. He has a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. The pawn can run two spaces, but after that, he's tired. He can only go one. If he starts running, he uses energy. He's already tired. He can only go one. So, would introduce that, and then would add the kings, and that adds a lot more diversity to the scene. The so, king. I mean, I already, you know, from the adult perspective, I already feel like, oh, I get it. You know, I, I feel like I'm learning something. I naturally I'm getting excited about learning something new um but i see this from the kids perspective too you know my godson is mm -hmm. going into fifth grade right now i could see this as something that he would just totally be into as well and um you know i definitely pick up on the the kid vibe that you give as well because it's you know like these analogies that you're given so are these uh tactics that your dad incorporated when he was teaching you or how did you kind of get into this uh you know, style of teaching. Well, here's the thing. Anyone can, chess has been around for hundreds of years, and anyone can teach the exact same stuff. In fact, a lot of this is the exact same stuff that the book will teach you. You can read any amount of chess books. It's how the pieces move, all the rules of the game, general strategies and tactics. But the idea is we teach it a little bit differently because we're recognizing it what we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. I have six different pieces that are all repeats, which make up 32 pieces in the game, a 64 square board, mm -hmm. and that's it. And we're competing with PlayStation and 3D on giant TVs that right. have explosions. Well, we have to be the explosion in this game then. Absolutely. And you have to make it exciting. And there's a lot to, to be learned and a lot of fun to be had with this game, mm -hmm. but you do have to have the patience to learn about the mechanics of the game. Absolutely. If you're not going to take the time to learn the pieces, it's no fun. Or if, let's say, uh, your older brother just showed you, okay, Anya, here's how the pieces move. Okay, let's play. And then he creams you. What are the odds you're going to want to play again? You need some incentive you to have, build back that ego that you just kind of And you have to have an understanding of the game. Sure. So... Wonderful. Well, tell me, what kinds of kids do you teach? Is this just private lessons? Do you teach in schools? We teach in schools, and we start as young as pre-K. Mm -hmm. There, it's a lot of repetition. We might be playing the pawn game for a lot longer. I might show up at one of your pre-K You would classes. do just fine in there. Um, when we get to, primarily, it's kindergarten to fifth grade. And mm -hmm. even as young as kindergarten, they have the ability to get all the way up to checkmate, and then some. So throughout the course of the curriculum, there is an extensive amount of chess knowledge, and we've put the most key components in our, our curriculum. Great. Well, this is very educational for me, uh, not just on the chess side, but it's been wonderful hearing your story of being half first-generation American. I'm really glad that you had a chance to connect with your dad and learn about his experience, how and why he came here, the fact that you said your knowledge of his experience and his history increased tenfold. Yes. Um, that's and one of the beauties of this project. And thank you for uh, having me do this because I learned a little bit more about myself even through that. Of course, and that's that's <laughs> the point. You know, this is uh, this is one of my favorite parts of first generation American project is um, you know having this kind of set up as a history or sociology project where we can learn about ourselves. We can teach other people about our cultures, our history, our past, and then um, we know who we are and where we're going a little bit more. And not to mention, get to learn some cool chess moves <laughs> along the way. Uh, Jay, thank you so much for joining us. So if anyone is interested in signing up their kids for this, or if an adult just needs a little help and maybe some pointers here, how can they connect with you? Well, if anybody has any inquiries, I would advise them to email us at info at ironrooks.com. Okay. And we will be having more open enrollment classes in the future. For right now, it's been mostly at schools and centers where it's exclusive to that location. Mm -hmm. But we will be doing some things in the future that are open enrollment so we can get more of all of Chicago involved. And we'll be putting some things on our website in the near future about that. Wonderful. Well, Jay, thank you so much for joining us. Like he said, anyone that is interested in getting some more information about chess, do email info at ironrooks.com. 
My name is Anya Jablonowski. Thanks so much for joining us for Drinks and Dialogue.